They're irreplaceable. We say irreplaceable real estate is built by people who don't live anymore with methods we don't do anymore and materials we can't get anymore and entitlements we can't get them to approve anymore. That's irreplaceable. And we layer our giftings and, and programming over it. It's unbelievable. And think about this. Even the, uh, even the insurance companies prove to us it's irreplaceable. Try to get something um, insured for actual replacement of what you have and you can't do it. Hey everybody, welcome to the Real Estate 101 podcast. I'm your host today, Patrick Donnelly, and with me today is a really special guest I am super excited to have on the show. I want to welcome John Marsh. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. My goodness, I'm excited about being here with folks like you guys. You do an amazing job. I just told you how the attention to detail and the quality of your content and you guys put 50 pounds of stuff in a five pound sack. You're doing a great job at this. Well, I appreciate it. I, we've already talked like 25 minutes just prior to the interview <laughs> getting started. So I've had a blast already. But I, I wanted I, I heard about you initially from Bobby Fion. I did an interview with him and he, I asked him who who was the developer or real estate guy that he person that he most admired. And he immediately said John Marsh. And I went down this John Marsh rabbit hole. I listened to the podcast that you did with Chris Powers on the Ford. And I was like, I got to get this guy on the show. So I really want to thank you first for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I've had a blast researching you, like as I, I talked earlier, but you've got an amazing story. I want to start off with your younger years. Talk to us about kind of the trajectory you were on, because one of the things I'd like to do with today's show is give hope to maybe one person that's feeling hopeless because you've been through that. We're going to get into that, but that's my, my goal for today. Just one person, if they listen to this and it changes their life in some way, that would be amazing. But so could you talk to us just a little bit about your young, younger years and the trajectory that you were on? Well, my heart leaped when you said that, because that's what I believe I'm ambassador of hope. You know, that's, that's what hope, if we've got hope in our future, we have power in our present. And so I hope that same thing that our story. So, you know, we don't normally change till it hurts too bad and costs too much till we know enough we want to, or to the pain of changing is less than the pain of staying the same. And so, you know, born in Albany, Georgia, about, you know, two hours from here, my mom had tried for 13 years to have a child, couldn't adopted me 18 months later, have my little brother super spoiled loved me. And I did everything my parents said until about 13 years old. And I stepped across the line and rebelled. Now you ask, why do people rebel? Well, because something in them wants to rebel. I mean, me and my brother ate the same Cheerios and he didn't rebel. Mm -hmm. And I did, but I had sex with a girl. I was 13. She was 12. I rode my bicycle over to her house. And I felt like I can't ever make this right again. I've, I've done something that couldn't be forgiven. That started me in rebellion is, is, is something that just grows and grows. What really kind of, so I, I found this, this young girl and she gave me acceptance. And then 14 years old started getting mentored in high-end car audio. I was building, I love car stereo before I had a car. And by 15 years old, maybe or 16, I was making a thousand bucks a week in cash after school. And I remember telling the teachers in my prideful little smart 16 year old, so I make more money than you do. Right. I felt like for the first time in my life, I was seen and I, and people cared and they respected what I had to say. And so, you know, that thing started growing in me. And, but what ended up happening is, so I, I'm making money, move here to Auburn, Opelika, where I live, have me a little business in the back of a big a guy named Big Jimmy. He was a big fat guy that loved me and had all these stereo shops. And, and, uh, and he, uh, he, he didn't like the girl I was living with. He's like, John, that ain't marriage material. I said, well, I, I don't know. I said, I can't take care of myself and she's good to help and take care of me. So what do I do? He said, I'm going to find you a wife. And so he went and started looking for me a wife. And um, this girl came up to get speakers installed in her car. And I said, whoa, Jimmy, she's pretty. And uh, he said, okay. He made note of it. And he ended up hiring her and betting her $500. She couldn't take me away from the girl I was living with. And that's my wife, Ash. <laughs> and so we got together and I was making $100,000 a year in cash working back there and um, just blowing it all. And, and we ended up 
a guy came by and said, man, can you fix these wiring problems on these cars I got? I'm fixing wrecked cars. I said, man, I can fix these things. I started fixing them. And he said, why don't we go into business together building totals? I didn't know a lot about it, but I knew a lot about wiring and cars from the stereo business. We started that business, long story short. We, um, within three years, we're a million and a half dollars in debt, $99,000 overdrawn. And, and Ash and I got married and I wasn't treating her the way I should and being a godly man. And she ended up leaving me for one of our employees who happened to be my banker's son. And you know, when there's no hope in your future, you start believing what you've experienced is the best you're going to have and cried out to a God I'd never met before. I thought Jesus was some old dude in sandals, but he came and touched me and transformed me and love got past the fence. And when it did, light lightning struck me. Every hair on my body stood up. And for the first time in my life, I felt truly loved and accepted. I wasn't looking for it, but he found me. And I walked out of that place totally transformed. I was like, I went downstairs and told my wife, who was, we've been arguing and we're going through this divorce and fight. And I said, I got born again. She said, you're a liar. I said, no, 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 I mean it. She's like, you're a liar. I don't believe you. And so I ended up watching her go out on dates for almost a year with somebody else while God began to heal me and work on me. And one of the things, the first thing he had me do, and remember obedience is what God cares about. You know, he cares about us obeying. And I knew in my heart, he wanted me to go ask the guy who had Ash had left me for to forgive me. That was the first thing he told me to do that I knew. And I always knew it was obedience because I didn't want to do it. But I went and did that. And I realized that in hindsight, God was setting me free, not just setting him free. And I had to ask him to forgive me for being a bad boss. And so that was the start of this amazing journey. And then through that seven years of counseling and therapy, Ash and I found one another again. We worked our way out of that debt. We got to zero. We're like, yes, zero. We thought we won the lottery because I never imagined that, that those things would come, that God could take something that was so broken and bring something so beautiful out of it. So you got to remember that's what God's game is. He takes broken things and makes them beautiful things. He takes, he redeems things. And so that's what happened to me. And that's not just what we went through. That's where he was taking us to. And so everything you're going to hear about how we build cities, work with couples, companies, and communities, it all comes out of the lens of the attic of that house being totally broken. So if you're at that point or you know anybody at that point, you're at a great place when the defecations hit the ventilation. You just got to make the right decision to lay your life down and he'll come and find you. People say, well, how do you find him? I said, get down on your hands and knees and tell him how good he's been to you until he shows up. That downtown was a place that's not safe. You can't go down there. And so Ash just said, I'm not all right with this, John. We can do something. I said, well, I don't know anything, but we're fixing, we're in the automobile business building totals. And so She's like, we can do something about this. And so if you keep wondering if, if somebody should do something, you may be the somebody. Mm-hmm. And so that's where it started. It was broken. And, and it started with us having, we bought this old house. They added on the market for $56,000. We offered forty six and about tore our arm off. I was like, oh, uh-oh, we may have offered too much. Been on the market for a couple of years. And it had a big upstairs um, about about 3,000 square foot and then three little apartments under the bottom in the basement. And so that got us into the real estate, but but living there and working on it six and a half years, one paycheck at a time, living in a 700 square foot apartment, we renovated it. And uh, it was the start of us understanding the potential. And were you doing the work yourself, you and Ashley doing the work yourself or were you hiring that out? How, how did that go? Both. We were trying to do it ourselves, and we kept screwing stuff up because we don't know nothing. You know, I mean, we did one bathroom three times before we ever got to go in there and use it. I mean, we just didn't know anything. And we'd hire people, but we're broke. I remember one time we saved up enough money to get HVAC in it because all we had was one big 220 window unit that blows snowballs. And that was the only air in the house. The rest, you're sweating your hiney off here in Alabama. <laughs> and uh, but, but we uh, ended up giving it to the contractor. and He went out of business and stole our money. Oh, wow. And so, so often we had to end up making do and constraints are beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think the blessing of being an early investor and be broke and have no outside capital come in, which we never have, has been amazing. It was the best thing that ever happened to us. 
because constraints make amazing stuff work out, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, we learned how to do this little by little, slowly by slowly, first to get back to zero and then to build the kind of portfolio we have, which we have over 200 properties in the 10 blocks now. And we've renovated over 300 properties, started over 60 businesses to save our town. So I want to kind of pause right there and really under, like have our listeners understand the magnitude of what you've done in Opelika. Starting with the house, it took, what, six and a half years to fix up. You've now done 275 properties. In a t we've, we've done 300 now. 300 now. Yeah. And 60 businesses in the town. <laughs> right. It's like absolutely incredible to me. And it, it did you start with, with that first project? Did you kind of have a vision of what you guys wanted to do or is it, was it something that unfolded as you went along? Oh, it's always grown organically like a tree. You know, I, I, I had, see, that's the thing I think most people kind of struggle with. I didn't know how all these disconnected parts fit together. I mean, what's the difference in being tangled and woven intention. Mm -hmm. And once you start seeing there's a God, a creator behind a creation, putting stuff together, you go, oh my goodness, everything I went through is part of where he's taking me to. So whether it was high-end car audio or building totaled cars, it was setting me up to renovate junky historic houses. And the great thing about starting with junky stuff is you can't hardly hurt it. <laughs> it's like, you know, if you're pregnant, you can't get more pregnant. And so we just say, I said, well, we can start anything we do is better. I mean, the first little investment house we did, we've got, it was a little house in a village called Pepperell here, which is a mill village. My wife used to live in it. Well, this, this man, he had it and it was junky, roof messed up. The floor was bubbled up in the kitchen like a tumor because they did the floor out of old ping pong tables, that particle board, and it was all bubbled up. And he said, I'll owner finance it to you, no money down, no payments for three months, and then $200 a month after that. And so we took our $3,300 tax return and put into that baby and fixed it up. And it was junky when we started and junky when we finished. <laughs> the, the walls looked textured because we got, had so many roaches. We just started including them in the paint job. <laughs> and so we get it done and a man comes by and says, I want to buy it and finish it. I didn't have any more money anyway. So he gave us $15,000 profit. And that 15,000 has come, has turned into everything we have. So what happened next with that 15,000? What did you guys buy another property and keep we the did. machine rolling? We put every penny. We never messed up the seed. We yeah. never ate that seed. We invested right. that seed in the next one. And what I began to realize is if I could solve people's problems, I could have tremendous potential. And so when there's junky properties everywhere, I go to them and I'd say, listen, you're paying property tax on this. You got to insure this. I noticed you got power on here. How about I lease this from you for two or three years, no money down, and then I'll improve it and I'll pay you off in three years. And that was the start of us using them as the bank and doing lease with purchase options or owner financing. And 60% of the portfolio we built were people's problems. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that's how we got it. And so we use them as the bank, which was an incredible way. You know, how do you turn something from a purchase to a refi? Well, have it seasoned. Yeah, right. Have it worth some time. And so that's kind of... You know, it's interesting. It, our business looks strange because it's called Marsh Collective, but it's a collective of companies and entities. But we do really three things, companies, co companies, couples, and communities. And it seems disconnected, but they all line up. So many of the couples that love communities and invest together want to build companies and vice versa. So maybe we start at the company level, but it, it ends up where it's all about people. And that's really what we focus on is people and places. And so what happens, it, the journey we took, we started in junkie residential, right? Because mm -hmm. it's the easiest thing to get into. Yeah. And I was doing a bunch of it. And then all of a sudden the city came to me and said, whoa, whoa, partner, you got 15 projects going. You need some license. I was like, uh-oh, I didn't know that. They're like, we're going to lock you up if you don't go get license. So I went and got some license so I could keep doing it. I told our city I've gotten my degree through our inspection department. Mm -hmm. I've kind of working an internship right. through them over a lifetime of learning what not to do. But it starts with a project or a property. Then we think people who continue this journey move to a portfolio. Mm -hmm. And then once they have the mindset, they can start seeing this portfolio as, for us, downtowns are complex mixed-use developments with fractional ownership. 
-hmm. We see them in a totally different way. And then once that's understood, we think the highest level of understanding is a platform. The iPhone is a platform, Mm -hmm. you know, and and we see our properties and the businesses and the companies we build in them as a platform for flourishing. And so that's kind of the describing the process. You go from one property to maybe a project or two to a portfolio to a platform. So I wanted to go into that a little more. What was that transition like from residential focusing on the junkie houses to then at one point you went to whatever, what's the main street in town called? In Railroad Avenue. Avenue. Railroad you know, Avenue. we celebrate a railroad like it's a river. Most people got a cool river. We had a railroad and it brought all the people in. You know, Opelika was one of the fastest two-day divorces in America back in the late 1800s. Had a lot of brothels and lawyers. So we had a little sketchy. We had a, uh, you know, it's it, we, we've had a sketchy past mm-hmm. early on. They used to ride through on the train and duck down under the windows because people would be shooting across the tracks. <laughs> And, uh, but the railroad put us on the map, honestly. So our, all of our buildings celebrate that railroad point toward it. So I want to hear about that transition from the junkie house to buy-in on Railroad Avenue, that first commercial building. What was that transition like? Was it pretty much the same? Were you just still doing, taking a junkie thing and turning it into, you know, a broken thing and trying to turn it into some, some kind of beauty? Everything's been that. What you just said like our criteria for buying something is it has to be broken, seen as unvaluable and it's unwanted. We don't extract value. We create value. And so when we buy something, we want it like the building, the big main building, this kind of keystone to the community we're building. I said, put it on the market for a year. And if nobody gives you an offer, call me. So we, we believe that our niche is to, is to create value, not try to find something that's a bargain and extract a little bit out. We bring our gifts to the table and we love that journey of, of, of beauty to bro- from broken things. Yeah. And so it started, I was working on a building downtown that a local guy owned and he asked us to do some work on it. And when I got done doing it, I said, man, I'd like to do this building. And I said, you're not good at this. You're a lawyer and you suck at fixing buildings. I can tell you that. And I said, people go hate you and you got a political aspiration. They go hate you for making these buildings junky. And I said, how about you owner finance this building and five more buildings, six buildings total? I said, I tell you what you need to do. I want you to owner finance it, no money down for five years. And I need you to give me $60,000 to take it. And if you do this, I'll give you half a million dollars profit in five years. Now, I had a better chance of getting hit by a meteorite and pulling this thing off. Uh But we pulled it off. The good Lord blessed our socks off. And we put the first businesses in downtown that flourished. I mean, on that street, there wasn't one business doing $100,000 a year in profits when we went there. And now there's almost probably $12 million worth of taxable income on that street now. That's wild. And... Talk about, I heard you talk with Chris, I believe, that that on Railroad Avenue, you kind of had this idea of Rent-A-Dream as you were fixing up these businesses. Tell us about the Rent-A-Dream program. Well, what we had is this idea. See, I think there's some some foundational mistakes I've made. And our not-to-do list is the magic list. People are like, well, we're going to do what you do. I said, well, if you can do what we do, you better do what we did. Because it's like push-ups. You can't outsource them. Yeah. You, you got to do your own. But we so I started realizing I couldn't attract the right businesses. Right. And so what I ended up realizing is we may have to create some of these because we're we fix up the buildings and get them kind of nice. And we thought, oh, man, we fix them up. People are going to pour in here. Well, they did. not mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, no, we're in trouble. We're drinking Maalox and making payments. I'm like, <laughs> maybe we this thing fixing to get ugly if we don't do something. So we said, well, what about if we put a business in there with somebody who wants a business, but can't afford to do it. And we invest a little bit in their dream and we need rent and they got a dream. And let's see if we can get this thing going. And honestly, it it took us to where we are. It's one of my regrets that I often in the beginning put people in businesses they shouldn't been in and it ended up hurting them and hurting us. And I lost good friends over that because I didn't have a way to evaluate it and help people understand what it meant. I thought if I could start a business, anybody could, because I was an idiot. I said, man, this is the sky's open for everybody. Well, I would oftentimes get people in businesses that were above what their character could could sustain and they'd crash them. So what do you mean? Like just because somebody who's a a good 
cook doesn't mean necessarily mean they can run a, a great restaurant. Is that kind of what you experienced? That's a great example. Yeah. And, and the fact that, you know, there's two bad things that can happen. You not have any income and it, it not work or you like when we started stuff, sometimes there would be like a restaurant with a three hour wait. You'd be doing a million and a half million seven a year by a guy that didn't have the character to sustain that in the business aspects. And it ended up, it ended up hurting us and hurting people. The learning curve was very expensive. So if there's anything we do now when we're going to, and we still launch businesses and create businesses in our own town because we have empathy because we're suffering. We still manage and love 10 square blocks. And that was our commitment. We're going to put our whole life to love 10 square blocks with everything we got. We've devoted over 25 years to 10 square blocks. And so that's a, a, and not to a type of business, not residential, commercial, industrial, to everything within that border. Mm-hmm. And every person in there, well, what we started realizing is you can't make a good deal with a bad guy. Right. And it's really hard to make a bad deal with a good guy. And we have to have a framework. So now as we launch businesses, and we still do this as part of our work, when we take on a patron is who we call loving a city. And we'll talk about this. We One of the big things we do is launch restaurants because I don't have a model that works without iconic food and beverage. I can't give people, think about this. Most people, nobody says, hey man, I went to the city, had this amazing experience. And said, what was it? They said, Ruby Tuesdays. <laughs> nobody says that because their goal is to disappoint you at a Rachel stand. Right. That's their hopes. And we can't get people to drive hours for things that are ordinary. They drive for extraordinary. And so we have to go into communities. Like one community we're in right now, Moments, Illinois, is a little town of 3,500. And we're building an iconic restaurant that's going to attract people from, they'll drive two hours away to get to this thing because we can move the needle with this if if we have iconic food and beverage. But we've got to have, we built a franchise system for the disenfranchised, we say. We've got the whole back-end system and model to create successful restaurants. Now, crashed about five getting that, so it was a little painful. So was that something you realized early on that you needed to have this iconic restaurant? It reminds me of an interview I did with Eric Weatherholtz, who does Who it. is the man. He is. <laughs> I love that guy. He, I told him, I said, man, I love the way you talk. Yes. Yeah. Both of you are very similar in, in what you're doing. Like he does taco oriented development. He's got, you know, patios and, you know, beer place to get a cold beer and sushi and just and then he calls it the halo effect where you create a space, somebody that wants to go to. And then the real estate all around there is, you know, the boat's going to. Yeah, it's going to rise. So is that a little bit of what your idea is in every project that you're doing? You know, we harmonize on that. And I, what I, what first got me there is I realized I could watch people go to the worst neighborhoods in our town for good barbecue. And I thought, oh, there's a lot of Mercedes around that barbecue place. And I started thinking about this. I started thinking, man, food moves the needle. Mm-hmm. It's incarnate. There's something about food that, 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 that there's very few things that have that kind of impact on us. And also, what can you put in 2,000 square foot that'll do 2 million bucks, but a meth lab and they're, exp- they're against the law, you know? So, so I was like, these things are needle movers. And so we did a deal downtown Opelika to create the Irish Bread Pub, which was our first hit restaurant there. And here's what a restaurant will do for you. It'll take you from your downtown ever having a great business, it being impossible, to it being possible, to it being probable. Mm-hmm. So we, I invested, me and Ash and our design, we did everything we could and even built out more than they paid for. We spent a million dollars downtown Opelika when there wasn't anything doing a hundred grand on the street. And we launched this restaurant. The, the owner said, we may do 750. That's our hopes, maybe 800. I said, I'll tell you what, one of my mentors out in Park City said, John, you got to get them on a percentage base lease and align yourself, give them a low break even, our break even on that. And we told them their rent, base rents was $2,500, okay? Ain't no way you can make a million dollar payment if you do the math on that. Right. So I'm praying for their success, of course, and we're aligned with it. But the first year they did like a million two. Second year did a million seven. Third year did two seven, almost three million bucks. And the business sold for a million dollars, business only, we kept the real estate. Mm-hmm. But what we did with that lease is 
See, banks don't want to loan money on percentage-based leases. Mm -hmm. So we had the lease gross amount ratchet to a new base. Mm -hmm. So 80% of the previous year's total sales would set the new base rent amount. Mm -hmm. And it would ratchet up. And so that, once that, that was successful, within a few years, we had three more restaurants doing a couple million dollars a year. Because no longer now is it impossible, it's possible. When it's possible, people start going, well, if they can do it, we can do it. So the next, we did an Italian restaurant. It did close to $2 million. And then somebody else put in this and that. And so it was catalytic. And I said, oh, note to self, this is a catalytic thing. Now, this is also the location of one of my biggest belly flops. And so how we belly flopped is this. We build this restaurant with the guys. And they sell it for a million dollars, just the business, right? Is we this all in Opelika? All of this is in Opelika, right? Right there on Railroad Avenue. This okay. is all right on that first story. This is early in, I mean, this was 12 years ago or something. Not that long ago. And No, and um, and we've done a lot of work since then. But, but what ended up happening was they sold it to a guy. And this guy, my wife had met when she worked at Red Lobster. He had grown up in Red Lobster, been there for like 17 years, went over and started working for Outback and it was acquired by Darden and he was there 13 years. So he's got 30 years in the food business, okay? He buys this thing and in two years, he drives it in the ground. It's doing less than a million dollars in, in the original owners. I beg them to take it back. Mm -hmm. And the mistake was this, there's people who can fly a 747 but can't build one. Mm-hmm. And there's a difference. And he was good at operating Darden's system. But when yeah. he came to this new thing, he, the system didn't come. And this was a, a tremendous learning for us about, I mean, you want something to work, you better have a good system. And what we ended up having to do is solve the restaurant problem of how do we build sophisticated systems to manage accounting, all the inventory to manage the, uh, the complexity of of being able to not see a PL once a month, which is way too late to make a decision. You only get 12 chances to change. You need minute by minute, hour by hour um, data to make decisions based on. And so we built a little system for that. A piece of software was working it. It got so complex. We found a system out in the world called Restaurant 365, which is a big behemoth of a system. Mm -hmm. It got trained on it. Now it's part of our implementation process of every restaurant we launch. So it sounded like you are really good now at developing and finding the right people for these businesses, for these projects. You had some belly flops, as you said, early on by not getting the right people in there, maybe hiring a good cook, but they can't run a restaurant. Talk to us about how you are finding the right people for the projects that you're doing. Because you, you put them through, a, what, a couple day intensive or something like that. I want to hear you speak to that a bit. And it's really the key. You know, we pick people, not just projects. A project doesn't work without a person. Everything's got to have a leader. And that leader has to either have the gifts or have the gifts on the team. So the first thing we do when people come like a lot of our patrons who we call it are real estate investors, they want to grow their portfolio. And like, I'll give you Midland, Texas. We launched a fabulous restaurant there years back that filled up a downtown building. It's called Opal's Table. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. 80 seat restaurant doing $3.5 million a year. Incredible. But what we had to do is we bring the operators that they're hoping would be the partners into Opelika. And we do a, we take them through a series of personality and of and other tests that we've kind of created and curated over time that helps us know where are their giftings and where are they lacking. Like, can they do back office? Can they do marketing? Do they understand true hospitality? If they tell me that IHOP is their hospitality model, I know where they are, right? And and can they make the food? And then you know, there's some intangibles that are a little harder, which is these understanding of creating leadership environments and curating. Restaurants are wholesale, retail, entertainment, and daycare all under one roof. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of our restaurants in 3,000 square foot will have 60 employees. Wow. You, The complexity of dealing with this, you've got to have a certain set of skills. And so what patrons will do, they'll send the potential tenants here, or owner operators, and we'll evaluate them and give them a go, no go. Mm -hmm. And if we give them a go... Then we go up to a plan and get all the documents together for correct alignment because most tenant 
in um, in kind of uh, landlord relationships are adversarial. Mm -hmm. They're not seen as their number one partner and collaborator They're saying, well, I got to pay the rent. Well, what we do is we build the model for the restaurant and inform the investor and the landlord what these people should pay, mm -hmm. not just what they could pay. Mm -hmm. And we started at break even and then we align the upside win so that like one restaurant that we have um, in one of our biggest uh, clients, they had a restaurant there that was doing about a million seven a year. We went to him and said, hey, I think this thing can do two and a half and said, if you'll go to the operator and say, how about I put one hundred fifty dollars in improvement, one hundred fifty thousand dollars in improvements in your space and you give us eight percent of everything you do above the most you've ever done. Mm -hmm. They said, man, that'd be great. Well, that percentage based rent has exceeded the base rents they were getting before. Now they're it's their highest paying thirty five dollars a foot. And, and they, the, the restaurants tickle because they're doing more than they ever done because the first million has a very little profit in it for most restaurants. The second has a lot more and the third has a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so you want to line that up and that's, that's kind of how we do it. And we do these personality testings and really there's like four things we test. Number one, number one, if you don't do anything else, is the five voices. That's five the number five voices.com created by one of our friends, uh, Steve Cochran. And what it does is it takes the, uh, the Myers Briggs mm -hmm. crazy letters that nobody can hardly remember what they're for. And it makes them in a real palatable way. Okay. And, and so we use that. We use the Enneagram, which is more complex, yep. but it gives us what they look like, healthy, average, and unhealthy. We use two other tools um, positive intelligence, which is free online. It's called the PQ and it's their positivity quotient. How positive are they in their life? If they're above like 65, we know they're beginning to flourish. If they're below, we know they're perishing. You want positive people. And then the last one is DNA. And it's not really a system. We do it this way. And I'll just describe it to you. Desires, needs, and affirmations. So your desire is for production or connection. Your need is for variety or stability and your desire for an affirmation is publicly or privately. Mm -hmm. And that formula gets people motivated. So it's the motivation formula is if you get their desire, their need and their affirmations aligned. So like for me, my desire is for connection over production. Mm -hmm. My need is for variety over stability. And my affirmation is for public. Like if you want to, if you want to give me a praise, put it on a billboard. Right. Don't tell me in private. Now, other people, if, if I did that to my partner, he would be upset with me. Mm -hmm. so, so those are the ways we look at people's uh, personalities. Yeah, that's interesting. For our company, uh, TIP, we had to do Myers-Briggs too. Um, and I know you're a ENFP. I'm an INF. I forget. I, I forget the letters too, but it's... Uh, See, the five voices will help you with that because in the five voices, I'm a connector creative. Uh -huh. And so those two give me a lens. That means I'm a future voice. I love visioning. I'm, my heart's tied to people. And I'm a feeler, not a thinker. And so as a thinker, you put ideas on the wall. And if you shoot them and they aren't good, it just hits the whiteboard. I put my ideas over my heart. And if you shoot them, you shoot me. Right. So if you got people on your team getting taken, the, when you critique their ideas personally, they're probably not a thinker. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> this is fun stuff. I want to I want to jump into mentorship. We started talking about it a little bit before the the show started, but you do you've had amazing mentors in your own life. You mentor people now. The, some of the guys we mentioned earlier um talk to us about your mentors, some of the guys that first have influenced you, and then I want to step into how somebody can find the kind of people that you have found in, for in your life. Hey everyone, it's Clay Fink here. Are you looking for an investment opportunity in a $2 trillion market? Look no further than Atacama, the cybersecurity industry's latest game changer. Atacama has opened its doors to U.S. accredited and international investors alike, already attracting over 5,000 investors and $6.5 million in capital. Atacama's recurring revenue model saw 10x revenue expansion in 2022 alone. They have patented technology and large contracts secured, including one with the U.S. Department of Defense. This is a limited time opportunity 
to get in on the ground floor of a rapidly growing cybersecurity startup. To learn more, simply visit invest.atacama.com slash WSB. That is invest.atacama, A-T-A-K-A-M-A dot com slash WSB. Full disclosure, I have personally invested in Atacama's equity crowdfunding round at a $29 million valuation. Please keep in mind that investments in early stage companies do contain risk. As with any investment, crowdfunding investments do offer attractive potential upside, but they cannot offer any guarantees of a future return. Great. Well, mentorship is, I, I don't know where I would be without it. Honestly, my, my longest mentor is 28 years. He's 83 years old and he's loved me and added value to me for so long. His name's Paul Estes. But then my second mentor, Don Martin, really taught me about money. He grew up in a mill village with a high school education, Cottondale, Georgia, right outside Augusta, and ended up build, helping build Century 21, one of the largest real estate companies in the world. And I met him. And so how do you know when you find a mentor? For me, I say my heart hums like a tuning fork. Mm. I said, if they speak to my heart, and not my head, I know they're one of them. Now, I don't know. One thing you got to know about mentoring, I think some people are, are mentors in our life and we mentor them for a season, mm -hmm. some for a reason, but some for a lifetime. Right. And so you got to know I'm a lifetime guy, so I want everybody to be a lifetime. But I know now some are for a season and some are for a reason. But these guys, Mr. Martin, he was so powerful because what he did is he came to me and and he began to speak to me in a way that touched my heart and it was humming. He believed in me when I was an idiot. Can you was, share the three questions that he asked you first to, before uh, he agreed to work with you? He asked you three questions that I thought were interesting. Man, and that, I thought they were, so first thing I said, I said, he said, man, I'm going to treat you like my son. I said, oh, wow, that's awesome. He said, I'm not giving you any money. I thought, mm. He said, but I'm going to teach you everything I know. And he still has to this day. So he said, there's three questions. When you answer these and work through them, that'll start our mentoring process. He said, how much is enough money? What are you going to do when you get enough money? And now that you got a living plan, what's your giving plan? Mm -hmm. And and he was so wise. And so when Ash and I didn't have $500 to pay our power bill, we put a line in the sand and said, this is enough money, net worth and income. And had and you thought come, about that before he asked you those questions at all? No way. Yeah. I was like, dude, just more than I got. Give me a, you got all this money. Stop being cheap and give me some and help me. Right. But he loved me enough not to help me. And those of us that are fathers now know that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I watched my sons struggle some and I want to, I mean, I could change their life in a moment. Mm -hmm. And for love's sake, I don't. I say sometimes it's like watching a car wreck in slow motion, the yeah. decisions they're making. Right. But I love them enough to know they can't, they got to do their own work. Sure. And and one of my mentors says, John, how much money does it take to ruin your kids? Mm. Not a lot. No. Or grandkids. And so, but, but, but what he, so we worked through that and it took about, honestly, about four or five months to close to six months to get the answer to that question. Cause I didn't know. Yeah. And that number, we said a net worth number and, and an income number that we believed we could live and give at the level we thought we were called to. Um, I, want, I and, want to know if that's changed over the years. Has that changed that number? Is it because that's what uh, I, I that's what I find is like when you you know you say this is my X number, it, it, it's easy to move that hurdle. Like it keep moving it out a little bit more. Well, I, I love what another mentor told me. He said, "John, uh, a luxury once tasted becomes a necessity." <laughs> right. And so, yes, I mean, in the beginning, you know, you think, and it has moved some, but it's interesting how much it anchored in me this idea of what abundance would be. And so, yes, as, as, as we've grown, but it's still in the, we still have a number in the background and it's really honestly not changed a lot. We call there's, so I think you can easily figure out how much it takes to survive. Mm -hmm. I think people have a vision for what it takes to thrive, mm -hmm. which is that one we just talked about. But the one we figure most folks can't find is wow. Mm -hmm. Like I'll stop. I won't work for inked up paper after this number. And most people think it's a lot more than it really is. What, what he helped me do, he said, John, I want you to envision the best day of your life. When you wake up and look at the ceiling, what's on the ceiling? 
When you look to your side, who's laying beside you? What kind of sheets? When you pull your feet out and drop them on the floor. He took me through this whole day, and then we built a budget that matched that, and it was a lot less than I dreamed of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I would encourage you. Do the work of knowing how much is enough and get aligned with your spouse. What will you do when you get enough? And I just said, I want to leave a legacy on the hearts of men and not sticks and bricks. Yeah, right. I want to make a difference. And then the last thing, we set giving goals right with our income goals. And we try to we try to beat them every dang year. Because yeah. if you're not giving, you're, you're going to get constipated. You're taking it in, not putting it out. You're going to be sick. Mm-hmm. Greed, the only antidote I found for greed is giving, generosity. Mm-hmm. And do you focus your, your giving in the community of Opelika or do you look to the larger world when you in your giving program? It's an interesting question. I love it. Um, actually, we used to give more globally mm-hmm. and regionally, and now we give locally. And it's. It, I really think those are three tiers. But for us right now, we're giving relationally. We want to know, we want to be uh, giving while we're living so we're knowing where it's going. And I want to know that person can de- deploy that and do something good with that better than we could. Mm-hmm. And for us now, our big goal and what we're started doing is giving away houses, which uh-huh. is my, it makes my heart leap because I believe home ownership changed our life and I think it can change others' lives. So, um, so say more about that. Of- How do you, when you give a home away, my concern, how do you have people have skin in the game? How, how do you make sure that they take care of the property that you've fixed up? And you know what I'm getting at? Like, how do yeah. you find the right person to, to give a home? How do you know if it's a need or a won't or if they're going to steward it well or exactly, not? Exactly. Exactly that. I just look at how they're stewarding what they already have. That's, yeah. If they're not faithful in a few things, they're not going to be faithful in many things. If their car looks like somebody turned a dumpster over it and it's all banged up, and they they don't take care of the potted plants on their porch. They're not going to take care of this stuff. <laughs> and so you've got to come alongside them and, and be willing to walk with them and show them because some people never knew, grew up knowing what it's like to take care of something. But, but um, if you, if you're going to do life on life, it gets real easy. If you're very distant from your giving, it's not easy to know at all. You better have somebody better have their life on it or, and that's one thing people always say, well, they call us to invest in their things. And I said, these people make a critical mistake. They think I have more money than I have vision. Mm-hmm. And I've never had more money than I've had vision. Mm-hmm. Like until I run out of vision, I got all the investment opportunities I need. Right. And until Opelika is flourishing from corner to corner, I got a lot of work to do. Me and our team, me and Ash, love is expensive. It's the most expensive four-letter word on earth. You go, it's going to cost you a bass boat, everything that means something to you. You got to put it on the table. And, you know, when I got saved, one thing I realized, I said, love got past the fence. And I started, God's definition of love is a high jump bar that's unachievable. Patient, kind, long suffering, no records of wrongs, hopes all things, believes all things, yeah. trusts all things, does not behave rudely. I said, God, if this is what you expect of me, I'm screwed. Mm-hmm. There's no way I can do this. And I felt him, him just show me. No, 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 no. That's not what I expect of you. That's how I'm going to be to you. Mm-hmm. And if I give it to you, you can give it away. And so that's where it really started. So what we say we do is sophisticated real estate development mm-hmm. with love. Right. And that's that's the key. And this mentorship, what Mr. Martin taught me is stewardship is it. And if I steward and keep up with every single penny I touch, I always have since, since my life transformed. But I've got mentors, I've got coaches, I've got counselors, and I got therapists. I say it's like I'm an F1 car and I need a big pit crew. Right. And so mentoring shares their experiences with you and gives you an opportunity to borrow their glasses. Coaching asks great questions and holds the tension of that question, believing the answers will percolate up out of you. It's not advice. It's it's holding the tension and asking great questions where counseling and therapy help you deal with previous, what we call nuclear waste in the basement or traumas so often work through things. And so even when I'm mentoring the, some of the men I mentor, I try to acknowledge when I move from mentoring to coaching or from coaching to mentoring or counseling, because it's a different lens. And I think we all need all of them. I mean, people say, well, I don't need that. It's like, can you fix an automatic transmission? They're like, no, I said, this is more complicated. Right. 
I mean, your life and your marriage and your relationships are way more complicated than automatic transmission. If you take one apart, that thing seriously, got, you better be an expert. So there's a, there's a lot of directions I could go right now, but I wanted to hear about your five, your five Fs. You, you, I think you kind of touched on it a little bit here, but you've got five areas of your life that you use coaches and counselors and mentors. Talk to us about the five Fs. So we, we realized that if we're going to steward things, we, we ought to have a framework for them. And so it's faith, family, fun, fitness, and finance. So I need a sophisticated plan for my faith, for my family, for my fun, for my fitness, and for my finance. And what we realized, if one of those is, is off, your total peace in life goes down dramatically. I mean, imagine you've got, you've got this great faith. You're, you're having great fun and your wife leaves you. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, remember factor one zero in your test score, you had all A's, now you got 80 or right. 75. And that's how our life is. And I watch people who build great real estate portfolios and their marriages suck. Yeah. Or they have, you know, build a, a great marriage and have great fit bodies and then their fun or their families messed up. And so what we said is we want the plan for each one of these to be as sophisticated as the other. And so that's what we work hard to do. We built some tools around that that allow us to do what we say. When when my life was crashing, you say, how do you dig out of a million and a half dollars in debt, $99,000 overdrawn when you're dumb? It's a great question. You know, I, mean, I was doing rock repair on houses for $150 a day. I couldn't do it. It's like squirting a squirt bottle in a forest fire trying to make, I take my payment up there like 70, it's $15,000 a month, principal and interest. I take them $75. And she was like, you are an idiot. I said, nobody gets in the shape I'm in without being an idiot. That's for sure. <laughs> and believe me, I know who I am without God. I tell people, I said, you want to know how dumb I was? I said, I financed a laser disc player at 19% and they stopped making laser discs before I got the, got the thing paid off. And so I know we've accomplished a lot and a lot of great things have happened, but God has been good to us and sent us a lot of help and mentors and wisdom. But, but what you end up realizing is most people don't have a sophisticated plan and not having a plan is a plan mm-hmm. is just a bad one. And so I'd encourage each person to even take that and ask yourself, rate one to 10, how, how well are you doing at each one of those? And I'm killing it in my business. I'm a nine. And then in my fun, I'm like an eight. Then my family is like a four. And my fitness is like a three and a half. It's like work on the things that's low, guys. Don't mm-hmm. work on the If you're an eight in some of them, work on the other ones. And, and build a plan. And, and for husbands and wives, it's to get in unity. But how it got me out of the hole was this story about fishes and loaves. You know, I love that story because Jesus like, hey, I got a little happy meal here with a little fish and some bread. And he's like, OK, sit down in groups of 50. He blessed it, broke it and multiplied it. And so I said, oh, so measure, manage, multiply. And I started using that in all five Fs, and that's, to me, the miracle framework of multiplication. I measure, I manage, God multiplies. And wherever God shows up, you're going to see multiplication. Like, go ahead and plant a a little kernel of corn. You don't get a a kernel back. And people say, well, I don't like what I'm getting. I said, well, then who's handling the planting? You don't plant corn and get apples. I mean, and so what I learned is in my, like, give you an example in money, I track every pity I touch. It seems complex. It's not that complex, but I haven't got since my life was transformed, not one penny that wasn't tracked. How do you do that? So back then it was harder. I had a little notebook I kept in my pocket and I'd write everything I spent in cash. Mm -hmm. We'd sit down with our checking account and look at every penny we spent and categorize it. We had our credit card statements. That was the three things. We spent cash, credit card, or check. Mm -hmm. Now, today, it's so much easier because I've got apps, right? Right. So my whole life is either credit card, check, or I use the Mint app to keep up with my cash. And so I just believe the idea of measuring something changes it. So, for example, if I track all my food and I do this with my fitness pal, just Mm -hmm. enter it in. It's real simple. Now, it's not perfect, but it's simple. And then I get on the scale every day. I'm telling you, I'm not deceived. The key to being deceived is you don't know it. When that thing starts pushing up, it's too much cheesecake. You know, so, so it's just simple things that we have to measure them and manage them. You can't manage what you don't measure, and God won't multiply what you don't manage. Right, right. 
how do you how do you measure and manage how do you measure i guess guess things like faith and family and fun i get fitness and finances those are those are straight you're a good question asker i love it. so well give you an example family was a tough one for us all right and um so we we've created this tool we're trying to develop we use it internally as a team it's a whole suite of tools that help us manage the five f's from an integrated team level and and what we ended up doing is so we do a peace score every year like what's our peace index for each of the five f's a peace and, and, index say yeah a peace index so for example think like if um we 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 go through this survey we have and you create a peace index so my peace index last year for finances may have been a 90 mm -hmm. and my fund may have been a 80. Mm -hmm. And it's just answer these questions. Once you have to put numbers to things, they get clear. Think about it like going, hey, where do you want to go eat dinner? And your wife's like, I don't care. Yeah. You don't care. No problem. All right. Uh, how about tacos? <laughs> well, I guess you do care then. Right. Well, what about it? So we go through these things. Finally, I was like, okay, tacos, one to 10. Two. Mm. How about we go to you know Chick-fil-A? Seven. Okay, six or better, we're going. So so this codifying of numbers helps. So what I would do with Ash is she gave a bad score on family two years ago. And I was like, what's wrong? And she's like, our parents are elderly and we're distracted, not spending enough time with them. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, what are we going to do to move the score? She said, well, I want to spend time with them. I said, tell you what, let's do. Let's either cook food or buy food for them. Welcome them in one time a month and we'll call them a family celebration. And our score went up. So we budgeted 12 family celebrations last year and moved the score. So it's the same thing. Fun would be how many times have we sat down and tried to find new friends in our community and had dinner with them. So it's you have to codify what you want to move, and it's putting a number on it. So we do that with all five Fs. That's how we do it. We turn it into numbers, even faith. Um, okay, how many times am I going to, you know, believe I have something that God put in my heart and step out and do it when I don't want to do it. I'm going to, or how many times am I going to notice people and give, like I'll try to load my pockets, put a couple of hundred dollar bills in there and say, I got to give these babies away this week. That's a faith act for me to stop and hand it to somebody courageously or try to get it to them without them knowing and saying, this is something that encourages my faith to be a giver. And so that's what we do. We codify them, put them into numbers, and it helps us go forward. There's so much I could get into here, but I want to hear, I mean, there's so much, but I, I want to hear a little bit more about when you kind of changing gears here and talk about what you mean when I heard you talk to Chris about irreplaceable real estate. Tell us a little bit about what you mean when you talk about irreplaceable real estate that you're involved with. So, but, but here's what we realized about irreplaceable real estate. See, we believe real estate, when we measure how we do real estate, it's three capitals, social, spiritual, and economic capital. Like, and we ask ourselves, how can we make our Sunday school cat teacher and our economics teacher happy? How do we work at the intersection of purpose and profits? Because people don't even believe that's possible. Right. But what we began to realize is why do we love these historic buildings and why are they so valuable and why are they sitting vacant? OK, and it's because they don't they, there's no potential. They don't see the potential for them to give the return of their investment and return on their investment. And this is a minimum criteria. I mean, if you look at Parable of Talents. God's like, well, bring me back the money plus some interest, but I prefer multiples. Mm -hmm. Right, And so what we looked at these old buildings, we said, but what's the value? So they're irreplaceable. We say irreplaceable real estate is built by people who don't live anymore with methods we don't do anymore and materials we can't get anymore and entitlements we can't get them to approve anymore. That's irreplaceable. And we layer our giftings and, and programming over it. It's unbelievable. And think about this. Even the, uh, even the insurance companies prove to us it's irreplaceable. Try to get something um, insured for actual replacement of what you have, and you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can't get the materials. We don't get, can't get the methods anymore. So you're telling me this is more valuable than a sheetrock box with driving on it. Right, right. And of course it is, but the, the appraisers and the banks have convinced us that if you've got a sheetrock box with driving on it that has a monthly income of $20 a square foot or whatever for the rents. And you've got a historic building that's got the same, that they're the same value. But the bankers are tricking us. I used to call them banksters. You know, is they're convincing us 
that that's only for the amateurization period. But when you look at it the way we look at it, we ask ourselves, well, what's it going to look like in 50 years? And so, I mean, a full masonry structure, masonry built walls, I keep a fabulous roof on it. It'll be here till Jesus comes back. Right. And so we're looking longer. And so with a longer time frame, it's not a little better. It's exceptionally better investment. And so we're going to continue to work on this and, and it's, it's powerful. So that's what we're doing. Let's talk a little bit about uh, diffused hospitality. You were just in Italy, weren't you? Weren't you like there a couple months ago or yet? Our oldest wedding? son just got, mar- got married there um, and, uh, and we spent the month of January there. It was incredible. Yeah, so I want to hear more about that. Talk about diffused hospitality and how Italy does that well. It is incredible. Um, Italy is so smart about so. I love what my wife said. Um, it, it, she said, John, Italy forces you to see what it takes to do things. Mm-hmm. And she said, everything that they make, you get to see how they make it in front of you. And so we started looking at hospitality. We asked ourselves, what's the best hospitality experience in our life and, and what they look like. And what we convince is that diffused hospitality is the answer, honestly, for us saving small towns and doing all the work we do. And the reason it's the answer, Italy does it well, is they'll take a little community, a village, and they'll take and put the, the all different kinds of structures or rooms and restaurants. And it's kind of a taking a hotel and exploding it apart. Some they call it scattered hotel or horizontal hotel or diffuse hospitality. And what we believe small towns can do is have a over, if you want to make a small town grow overnight stay, celebratory um, events and iconic food and beverage, will do it. Mm-hmm. We can get people to go, you know, two, three, four, five, six hours to do that. You see Blackberry Farms and places like this. We're going to the middle of nowhere, but they're not a tower. It's not this huge cylinder of rooms. They stack you on top of each other like the, like the Days In or the Holiday Express. What what people want is to feel like they're a part of a community and not just a tourist. And so we believe this is the future where we're going is diffused hospitality because we believe it's one of the few things where operational income can roll up into real estate value. And the banks understand it. They understand resorts. Mm -hmm. And so there's models there in place that help us get to the capital we need And the banks understand it when we view historic downtowns and places with diffuse hospitality. Talk to us a little bit about your view of historic small towns becoming their own asset class. The will of private equity. Absolutely. And and I didn't, again, all this is like off after a while. I mean, it takes a while. It wasn't a, so, you know, it's what I began to see is, we saw commercial real estate as a as an asset class. Then we saw people buying residential homes and collecting them together, 10,000 homes or a few thousand homes in this an asset class. I started going, how many small towns across America have tremendous embedded value? I mean, um, like one of the towns we're working in, our clients just spent like four four and a half million dollars and bought 40 buildings. Mm-hmm. Four, four and a half million? Yeah. And about 150 something thousand square foot. Mm-hmm. And, and and we can turn this thing into a rocket ship. And, and people say, well, how will we put amazing food and beverage, overnight stay and celebratory events? And they're within an hour or two of, of, a, of a larger population. We've got a small town in Kentucky, a town of 3,500. A restaurant. Or no, what's it called? Uh, Stanford. Stanford, that's right. Stanford, Stanford, Kentucky. And one of our first clients, uh, Jess Carrill, and that restaurant sees 8,800 people a month in a small town of 3,500. So it tells you how much these things draw when you're excellent. And they close at three o'clock, right? That's right. (laughs) They they don't have dinner, but two nights a week and they closed on Sunday. Yeah. And so what we realized is if we could do this, it could be incredible. So Imagine this. Imagine us going in and and people start seeing a platform for saving small towns. Mm -hmm. And these real estate portfolios are not something that in the beginning, they don't look exciting. But over time, it's exponential, the amount of growth you see in these platforms and the amount of revenue they can create. I mean, we've got one model we're working on a small town that'll put $4 million in, um, in profits a year on the bottom line for this one project. 
and that'll put its value, you know, 40, 50 million bucks. Yeah. And so that's no joke. Right. Yeah. And our, our, our biggest town, which is really amazing. We'll talk about that in a minute. I guess we lay on the plane, but it's, uh, it's Winter Haven, Florida. Mm-hmm. It's about a hundred and fifty million plus dollar portfolio, and it is incredible. And uh, and it's making tremendous value for those investors and for that community. And and they are all you call them patron patrons. Are they mostly local people that want to see Winter Haven thrive? They, in fact, we we help them raise eighty million dollars from sixty locals. Wow. And they and they they bought almost eighty blocks of their downtown. So yes, and that's sophisticated with you know the the way the portfolio and platform like how do we do handle people who want to get out and have redemptions? How do we handle all those things? There's a lot of complexity, but we know now with stewarding about two billion dollars worth of this stuff around America, we can see it at scale now. So we believe there is a new asset class coming forward of irreplaceable real estate because they're not making any more downtowns in your mm-hmm. town or ours. Mm-hmm. And if we can steward them well and bring sophisticated real estate tools and development over it with sensitivity and love, I think it's they're going to be incredible. So when Winter Haven approaches you to, to consult, to help with this development, what where do you start? What's the first thing you do when you go to when you go to Winter Haven and check the place out? You know, we usually start with what we call an intensive, which is a two-day either in our city or their city. And we work on looking at what we've designed called the momentum method. We think having no momentum makes you look worse than you are and having momentum makes you look better than you are. Mm -hmm. And so you got to get the mo, you got to get it moving. But we say it's these things. This vision is number one, clarity of vision, a, a clear strategy, then you've got to have to know who's on the team and what are the roles. And then after that, you've got to get them in alignment, execution. And the last one is my favorite, success and succession. And so we align this momentum method up. And most people have a vision, but it's fuzzy. And so if the prize is fuzzy, no price is cheap enough. Mm-hmm. You get the prize real clear, the price gets easy. And so we help them clarify their vision and then move through the other pieces to like, what is a minimum viable team? How do you, you know, how does this fit together? How do you build this? And, um, and then how do you make it where the capital work, which most people think it's the money and it's never been the money for us. Money's there's plenty of money to follow money. Never fought. You know, you just money always follows great vision. You never Mm -hmm. see people get a bunch of money and get a clear vision. Right. Right. Say more about what your view of success is. You had an interesting comment that I heard about that I wanted you to go into, like when, how you view success of these, these small towns. Well, a lot of it's human flourishing. I mean, we actually try to look at a flourishing score. I mean, how do we know if the place is flourishing? We say flourishing is when the people who have the least are experiencing the most. Mm-hmm. That's flourishing. Yeah, And so we work harder on that and to think about that. We also create social, spiritual, and economic capital. It's got to be all three. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that for us is when a place is healthy, you know, I think one of my big friends, Eddie Morton down in Florida, Orlando, says this at Lyft. He says, you can mix age, you can mix race, you can mix economics. The only thing you can't mix is values. Mm-hmm. And we, we agree with that. We've had no trouble, you know, getting people to, to understand a clear vision and come together as long as the values are similar. And yeah. so that's the question is, you know, what's the values? And so I see one index I really like called the popsicle index is how far a kid need to walk to get a popsicle. Mm-hmm. And so we, we just think for each community, we customize it. But usually it's like a community, um, a community impact number that we do and we do that right along with economic numbers and then we know you measure economic capital from it what comes out of it but you measure social and spiritual by what you put in it and you need long-term patient capital in these projects right you're not looking for people that that don't have patient capital to to sit with you during this process of it's about a seven year to get to where people can understand but i say it needs to be patient properly aligned and productive, Mm -hmm. those three things. But it should be, over time, it's not an average investment. 
it's an exceptional investment. Yeah. In fact, as it gets out more years, this thing goes like crazy, like a hockey stick. But but it takes some patience. And and here's the thing: the cost we call it the velocity of money. Mm-hmm. The cost of redeployment is expensive. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people want to do wham and bam, hit and run, get it, get out, get it, get out. Well, you got to be yeah. that's activity, not accomplishment. Mm-hmm. And and we just don't. I mean, that's just not our model. We we're not an IRR driven. We're driven by overall return over decades. Mm-hmm. And if you look at Warren Buffett's net worth, it's the same kind of thing. It goes like this and it does like exactly. this. Exactly, right, right. And so that's how we build real estate portfolios. I mean, we want to build machines. Who wants a fig tree that don't make figs? Mm-hmm. Jesus hated that fig tree that didn't make figs. He started to call it a bush. <laughs> and that's why we don't build these things through benevolence because if you got to, we want something that people will want to fight over at your death. It's such a valuable asset. It's so irreplaceable and iconic yeah. that, that everybody won't stand in line for it. Yeah, it's this is great stuff. I absolutely love talking with you here. I want to hear more about your podcast. We talked a little bit about it at the beginning before we started recording, but it's called Redemptification. Tell right. us about that word and tell us a little bit about the podcast. I want to hear about some of the guests that like you've had on that have just, I don't know, like you've blown my mind today. <laughs> like, <laughs> some of the guests that have like just been influential and impactful to you. Well, I've had some of my mentors on, which I love that because they, I don't know where they stop and I start. Mm. My heart is woven into them and them into me. Um, I, my, one of my guests that I just love, I had recently um, was uh, a guy named John Rivers. It hadn't been po- published yet, but it's coming out here soon. But he created the Four Rivers uh, uh, Smokehouse, the, the barbecue restaurants, 20 of them. Uh-huh. And he's just a super cool guy that that has the same vision as me. And it's coming out real soon. And he just walks through, how did a man go from running a billion and a half dollar healthcare company to love smoking meat and making barbecue? <laughs> and then how are they building an organic farm, 40 acres in downtown Orlando? And how did they feed over a 1.2 million families last year? Mm-hmm. And so he's just an amazing guy. Um, I love the one on there with Steve Cockrum, the Five Voices founder, me and my wife and him talk about what it's like to, you know, Ash and I built companies together side by side for our whole marriage. And that's dynamic and interesting. And so the reason to say his name again, Steve Cochran, Cockrum, C-O-C-K-R-A-M. Yeah. And he's a, he's just one of the most insightful, amazing guys. You know how he created the five voices. He asked himself, um, if you're familiar with the screw tape letters, the books, yeah. Yeah, see, what he said is, what if I was going to use personality types to take out leaders? How would I do it? And so he created this model and then he reversed that and figured out how to make them flourish. And that's what created the five voices, which is incredible. So he'll tell you, that. what's your five voices type? And then what's the weapon system you use when you're unhealthy or stressed? And it's, it's incredible. So I, I love that. And the word redemptification kept saying, you're yeah. gentrifying, you're gentrifying. I said, we're not gentrification, we're redemptification. They I said, what that. is that? I said, we're redeeming people and places to their intended beauty and glory. Yeah. And I said, you'll see the difference from what we do. I love that. I'm going to start using that because the the word gentrification just has so many negative connotations. And it, in, in many ways, it's unfair to what you're you're doing. You know, like it's, I love it's, it. It's totally, they, they don't have any other models. So we don't have yeah. models to understand. And I just said, man, when we're coming, not many people are going, here comes the developers. We're glad to see them. Right. They feel like they're pickpockets going to come take everybody's pocket and mess up, build a bunch of ugly stuff. And I said, no, 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 no. We're going to come and add value and not extract it. We're going to show up. You're going to be wanting to cheer and see us. We're going to do stuff you're going to love. You're, we're going to do the stuff you're going to protect in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Because love looks different. It sure does. It sure does. I'm going to steal something that you do on the podcast to wrap up here. I want to know, you you ask, like, one of your questions is, who should I know that I don't know? And then what should I be reading? So I want to go into that. Who who should I know that you've had on? Or I don't know, anybody. I'd love to be introduced to Brett Kaufman. He's a Columbus Uh, guy. I'll plug you in with him, my friend. You know, I love relationships. And that's if I ask the same 10 questions to everybody when I talk to them personally trying to learn 
And one thing I can encourage people, get you 10 great questions and ask them, because what that'll do is let you borrow the same perspective from different people. And this, you know, experience takes in experience that is reflected on can take it and turn it into insight, you know? Mm, right. And so we want to evaluate our experiences so we can make insight out of it. And like, if I asked you those same 10 questions, ask everybody else, I'm borrowing your lens on like, how has failure shaped your life? Right. Tell me three things to always do and three things to never do. Yeah. And these questions I asked, but one of them, the biggest pulling one is who do you know that I should know? Yeah. And will you introduce me? Right. And that thing's taken me all over the world. So that's where this question came from. I tell you, check out 610, S-I-X-10 in uh, Winter Haven, Florida, Bud Strang and that organization. They're the city that's doing this the most at scale of anybody in America. And they're, the work is incredible. 610 LLC in Winter Haven, Florida. And if you get a chance, go there. That's where Lego Land is, the former Cypress Gardens. And it's a city of 100 lakes. But the courageous vision of Bud and his family from the citrus business to love a place is it, it's it's inspiring. I'll check it out for sure. And then what about what should I be reading? I tell you, this is like you ask it. You know, I feel like a mosquito in a nudist colony when all the great books, they're everywhere. I want to read them all. And my team says, I know every book you read is the best word you just read. But one I read recently that has shaped our whole business. And the way we do things is unreasonable hospitality. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, unreasonable, unreasonable hospitality by Will Gadera. And he built a restaurant that won the best restaurant in the world in New York, 11 Madison. And that book, plus a few others, shaped the way that we see hospitality. And my wife's definition of hospitality is the guiding force of our company. And now she runs all of our companies. Um, and it's I, hospitality is I thought of you before you got here. Mm. That's her definition of hospitality. She said, that's what God did with us. That's what we do with others. That's great. Hospitality is, I thought of you before you even got here. That's right. Very cool. John, this is awesome. I have loved talking with you here. I feel like I could go on for another hour or two, but we're going to put a, put a pin in it here. Talk to us. Tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you, how they can find out more about you. What's the best way for them to do that? marshcollective.com is a good place to land and uh, you can see us on the normal social media things and that's and check us out at redemptification.com that's r e d e m p t i f i c a t i o n it's a mouthful but it's worth it and uh and it's some of the cool people we're around so those are the ways you can catch up with us and uh and hopefully we can add value well you have you have completely added value to my life i know that so i just really want to thank you for your time john Thank you, my friend. The analytical approach started with measuring new things, which was a lot of painstaking work, and then data analysis could happen after that. That is the exact same approach that I have taken to apartment floor plans. The idea that as part of this product is that more buildings should be built that way. 